sorry about that. My phone was ringing on vibration. Anyways, where were we? Oh yes. The account books have pages headlined received from farm for 1891 and from 1893 through the end of the century. In 1891, a record year, the page lists hay and straw, wheat, rye, corn, eggs, butter, apples, pumpkins, melons, potatoes, asparagus, calves, old cows and ponies, with a total of $881.11 for the year. The proceeds fluctuated, but the scale of the farming tapered off over time, hitting a low of $57.48 in 1899. To support the farm and gardens, a gardener's shed, chicken house and a hog slaughtering shed, renamed the farm shed by the National Park Service, were built between 1885 and 1900 to supplement the old barn. The combined chicken coop and tool shed was a frame building by building for 40 by 14 feet that housed approximately 100 chickens. The hog shed was a clapboard structure approximately 12 by 18 feet. The windmill erected did between 1884 and 1886 to pump water for the estate. The gardens were splashed with color from carnations, petunias, marigolds, zinnias, and snapdragons. There were peach, pear, and plum, and cherry trees along with currant, gooseberry, and grape bushes. The vegetables were planted on the eastern side and included corn, asparagus, beans, beets, carrots, potatoes, tomatoes, lettuce, cantaloupes, watermelons, strawberries, and raspberries. Hmm. The gardens, fields, woods, and shoreline, and the books, nooks, and crannies of the lively house made growing up at Sagamore Hill one continuous adventure for the Roosevelt children. The guide for this adventure was lar the larger-than-life T.R. We particularly valued Father as a companion, Ted the Third wrote. He could think of such delightful things to do. Quiet, loving support and occasional restraint was supplied by their mother. Sagamore Hill Summers brought together a pack of rambunctious and inquisitive children. Each of Theodore and Edith's progeny had a cousin his or her own age at the nearby homes of William M. Lynn and James West Roosevelt. Other cousins, such as T.R.'s niece Eleanor, were also frequent guests. To entertain their father and other relatives, the Roosevelt sons, cousins, and friends once organized a circus in the barn in which they performed tricks. T.R. wrote in The Outlook, a weekly magazine. There could be no healthier and pleasanter place in which to bring up children than in that nook of old-time America around Sagamore Hill. Certainly I never knew small people to have a better time or a better training for their work. They were never allowed to be disobedient or to shirk lessons of work, and they were encouraged to have all the fun possible. They often went barefoot, especially during the many hours passed in various and throwing pursuits along and in the waters of the bay. They swam, they tramped, they boated, they coasted and skated in winter. They were intimate friends with the cows, chickens, pigs, and other livestock. They had in succession two ponies. One of the ponies, a gift to Alice from her grandparents, was named General Grant. It was loved, beloved by all the children, with the exception of the time that the horse tried to eat Ted the Third's straw hat when he was three. <laughs> the horses were a small part of a revolving menagerie. There were many dogs, of course. Also numerous were guinea pigs, named, without regard to the sex of the animal, by the children for important figures such as Admiral George Dewey. They named a pig Mammy, who failed to appreciate the honor. Hens received the names of characters and books their parents read to them. There were also kangaroo rats, r flying squirrels, rabbits, a short-tempered but basically friendly badger, and even a young black bear that children christened Jonathan Edwards. I wonder who he was. Many of the animals ended up in a small space about 220 feet north of the house that was used as a pet cemetery between 1902 and 1917. It was marked by a stone dedicated to faithful friends. T.R. immersed the children in wonders of nature as soon as they could walk. They learned the names of birds and flowers. One of their favorite spots was the woodpile pond, adjacent to where the wood that T.R. and others chopped wood was stored. 
Ted the Third described it as follows. A noisome bit of stagnant water and black mud into which the pigsty drained. We liked it particularly because countless turtles sat on the rotten logs that lay there or slowly swam over its surface, their heads sticking out of the green scum like small periscopes. Along with appreciating nature, sports and physical activity were prized at Sagamore Hill. Prominent in the memory of the family, in the memory of family members and guests, were the scrambles around the property, particularly a subset, TR's point-to-point -point hikes. This consisted of in selecting some landmark and going it to it without turning aside for anything. Ted the Third would write. If a haystack was in the way, we either climbed over it or burrowed through it. If we came to a pond, we swam across. Okay, that I wouldn't do. Jesus, if they're not properly dressed for it. Anyways, as the scrambles became more strenuous, Edith dropped out. But T.R. continued to lead the boys, for whom a tear in the a pair of, a tear in the pair of trousers was rather a badge of honor. Huh. Some of the scrambles and other Roosevelt activities would horrify modern day parents. TR wrote to Bammy about finding a hollow tree with an opening twenty feet above the ground. The other day with much labor I got up the tree and let each child in turn down the hollow by a rope. Two locations were frequently mentioned by Roosevelt's and their guests as the biggest sources of excitement. T.R. wrote, One of the standbys for enjoyment, especially in rainy weather, was the old barn. It stood at the meeting spot of three fences. A favorite amusement used to be an obstacle race when the barn was full of hay. The contestants were timed and were started successively from outside the door. They rushed inside, clambered over or burrowed through the hay, as suited them best, dropped out of a place where a board had come off, got over, through, or under the three fences, and raced back to the starting point. Ted the Third wrote, We kept our records with as much care as if we were competing in the Olympics. The barn was also a frequent site for playing hide-and-go-seek. We tunneled the hay until it was like a rabbit warren, and nearby was another attraction. The stable, a disjointed rambling building full of musty corners and promising mysteries. Old harnesses, saddles, eel spears, and a hundred other er, odd oddmans, other oddmans are piled in the dark under its eaves. The other favorite spot was Cooper Bluffs, Cooper's Bluff. The steep glacial hill on its northeast corner of the Cove Neck Peninsula, overlooking the harbors and the sound, was located a mile from the Sagamore Hill residence on the other on the property of T.R.'s cousin, Emlyn. T.R. Took his, often took his children, other young relatives, and guests there up to run up or down the sandy slope rising from the beach. Ted the Third recalled, One late autumn afternoon when Mother was not with us, we had a race down the bluff. One day, one after the other, tripped and fell. We reached the bottom dusty, bruised, and breathless, this was all very well for the boys who enjoyed it greatly, and to whom a scar more or less had made no difference. But my sister Alice got a gash on her forehead. When we reached home, father was in deep disgrace. Ugh. If the tide were ho was high, there was an added thrill of some of the contestants were sure to run into the water, T.R. wrote. Fully dressed? I don't think so. The water, was an, the water was an irresistible attraction. A dock was built out into Cold Spring Harbor in June 1890 at a cost of $29.24, but it no longer existed by 1906. There was a floating wooden platform anchored off the beach that took the place of a fixed dock. The Roosevelt's frequently used the dock on William Emlyn's property to the north. T.R.'s method of teaching the children how to swim was simple. Drop them off the end of the pier into deep water. They might be horrified at the prospect, but knowing 
They had to keep up the family tradition. They all jumped, as did their cousins, including Eleanor, the future first lady. T.R. noted, As soon as the little boys learned to swim, they were allowed to go off by themselves in rowboats and camp out for the night along the sound. Sometimes I would go along so as to take the smaller children. Once a schooner was wrecked on a point half a dozen miles away. This gave us a chance to make camping out trips in which the girls could also be included. For we put them to sleep in the wreck, while the boys slept on the shore. Squaw picnics, the children called them. Edith was surprisingly tolerant of the exuberant outdoor activities organized by T.R. with his cousins, West, J. West and W. Emlyn, and she often joined in. But she also knew when to rein in her husband. Even as Vice President of the United States, Roosevelt was not exempt from the wrath of his wife and other mothers when he took his children, the neighboring cousins, and their mothers on an all-day picnic. It featured a menu of what Ted III recalled was baked clams and cinders, sandwiches and sand. While the mothers rested in the shade, sewing and chatting, T.R. took the children for a walk. When they wanted to go in the water, he let them go wading in their clothes, but soon they were swimming and their mothers were not thrilled with their wet, sandy appearance. Ted III described the long row home was very quiet, with his father pretending that he was not there. Theodore and Edith also enjoyed the water together without children and the associated drama. T.R. would launch a boat into Cold Spring Harbor and then row them for miles to nearby beaches or marshes while they read Browning and other poetry. The family had a bathhouse situated on the Cold Spring Harbor Beach as early as 1888 and also a boathouse. Riding was an integral part of life at Sagamore Hill. The children had their ponies, while Theodore and Edith had riding horses, including T.R.'s prized hunter, Sagamore. Roosevelt enjoyed fox hunting and other cross-country rides as well as polo. As a proponent of what he called the strenuous life, T.R. not only hiked point to point, but rode horseback the same way. That was not appreciated by the local farmers whose fields he crossed. Edna T. Layton, who grew up in, on a farm in East Norwich, just south of Oyster Bay, wrote in a memoir, it, is not it was not uncommon for him to ride across my grandfather's farm. He did not go around the field, but right across it, thus ruining whatever crops his horse stepped on. This made the nearby farmers very angry. I'm not surprised. Roosevelt, who had ridden up with the Meadowbrook Hounds and sponsored fox hunting meets since the house was built, wrote in the Century magazine, There are plenty of foxes around 